62M1161 Ancaster, uh, PED 19169, Ward 12. Members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding the zoning bylaw amendment. The person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the local planning appeal tribunal. And the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before LPAT unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So I'm going to go out to the public. Uh, if you could indicate with the, your hand, are, is anyone here uh, wishing to speak with regard to this item today? Again, this is um, Ancaster 253 Fair Street and 455 Springbrook Avenue. Is there anyone here from the public wishing to speak to this item? Going once, going twice, three times. Thank you, everyone. Seeing that no one uh, came forward, and this is Councillor Ferguson's um, ward. Councillor Ferguson did send me an email that he is in support of this. So um, may I motion first to uh, close off the public meeting. Move by Councilor Brenda Johnson, second by Councilor Whitehead. All in favor, recorded vote. Show of hands, carried, thank you. And uh, now how about staff presentation? Do you wish to, re we can waive it. Move by Councilor Whitehead, second by Councilor Partridge. All in favor? And that, could we, do we have an electronic vote on that, Madam Clerk, to waive it? No, thank you, that carries. And now I'm gonna call Nancy Friday of GSP Group, who is in attendance. Nancy, just come on down. Tell us you're in support of the report and recommendation. Hmm? Yes, she does. She's the applicant's agent. Good morning, Nancy. Good, good morning, Madam Chair and members of committee. Um, uh, I did have a brief presentation, but I, I, I don't think it's necessary now. We, have, we, are, um, we are in support of, of, I've read through the staff report, we're in support of the uh, recommendation and this is the first step towards once it's rezoned um, the land will be severed and the ultimate result is for lots for single detached dwellings excellent so i do have councilor Pardee, did you have a question i'll put you first then go yes. ahead yes yes uh, madam chair just um through you to staff Appendix E of the report. I, so hang on, just of the of the agent. That's oh no no sorry. Yes. Okay, so I'll come back to you, Councillor Danko of the agent, applicant's agent. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the only real change here is that uh, you're requesting a 45 percent uh, lot coverage up from 35 percent. If I do the math, that works out to a 2,000 square foot ground floor um, coverage versus 1,600 square foot ground floor coverage if we just stuck with the 35%. So can you explain to me why it's necessary to build houses that are 10% bigger? Um, well, we reviewed the, um, the zoning in the area, the R4 zones surrounding the subject lands, and they are at 40 to 45%. And it's, it's the, the yards can still be met and uh, they can build a bit of a larger home at 45%. But it would be up to the developer whether or not that occurs or not. Well, I, I think we know that's going to occur. Likely, yes. Okay. Through you, Madam Chair. So because the surrounding homes are bigger, to follow through, the reason is that these houses need to be 10% bigger than what's provided. Yeah, the, the, through you, Madam Chair, the lot size is in the uh, phase eight, nine, eight, eight and ten meadowlands, uh, which is the bulk of the development to the east. Um, their zoning allows for the 45 percent, and it's a way of, of, of also, you're, you're correct, and a bit of a larger home, but also consistency in terms of the built form. Okay, I'll follow up with that question to staff. Thank you. Thank you. So, no further questions of the applicant's agent. May I have a motion to receive the presentation? Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Clark, all in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. And now, now I'm going to turn to, well, we have, we're going to have a motion to approve the application with an amendment on how the public submissions, the public submissions received did not affect the decision. So it's moved by Councillor, okay, thank you, we'll just get the motion or the recommendation on the floor. Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Collins I'll, and Councillor Danko, now question to staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. So same question through you to, uh, to our planning staff. 35% required, 45% modification, justification for that extra 10%.
Through you, Madam Chair. The, uh, this is just to, as the uh, agent has said, it's to create consistency and uh, it's been reviewed as well from engineering perspective. It meets all the criteria. There wasn't uh, any reason why not to support it. If I can add to the Madam Chairman, if normally if you take a 40 by 100 foot lot, the front side and rear yard setbacks get you to 44%. When municipalities went to that lower provision, the 35%, you ended up with sort of the snout or the house where the garage was out front and the living space in the back. So primarily by eliminating that dead space and bringing the front door closer to the street, that's what that extra 5% in GFA gets allocated in that space. So essentially it's really focusing along the street edge and de-emphasizing the garage, which is typical of 1980s era of construction and trying to bring the front door, front porch, living space closer to the street edge. And from a design perspective, that's why staff have been looking at increasing the lot coverage up to that 44, 45%, which is normally what you get when you look at the front side and rear yard setbacks. And then we make sure that from an engineering point of view, that from a stormwater and um, perspective, that that gets factored into the calculations in the design of the area. And then in this area as well, that's been consistent with the other planning approvals that have been given in the last five to 10 years to re uh, relax that lot coverage restriction and more regulate through the yard setbacks. So um, in, the, in a long way, what we're saying is from a design perspective, we're trying to provide a little bit more design flexibility in the houses and de-emphasize the garage as the predominant street scheme streetscape feature that you get when you have those lower lot coverages because that's essentially what they do. They just carve out that space between the front of the garage and the front door and that from a pedestrian perspective is less than an ideal situation and that um, in other areas that don't have lot coverage, 45% is generally the rule and we do make sure through the engineering submissions that the proponents are using that higher lot coverage in all of their calculations to make sure we don't have any problems down the road. Thank you for that, and I, I think my hesitation is is always that on the Central Mountain, the, uh, the existing housing stock with pretty much the same size lots have less than half um, the footprint that is being approved here. So it's, it's just giant house, small lot, and um, I'm gonna continue to ask that question with the uh, indulgence of committee, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Partridge, your mic is on, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going, just asking a question of staff with regards to Appendix E to the report where um, I'm assuming it's a, a resident had said they're in support of the application, however, requesting a condition be put to require the developer to pay the proportionate share of costs associated with urbanization of the uh, Springbrook Avenue. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. I didn't see anything in the report. Does that happen already or...? Through the chair to the council, that will be part of the uh, consent application. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Well, first part, uh, Mr. Robichaud took all the words right out of my mouth, so I appreciate you for it. Um, the second piece is um, the second piece is the um, no one talks about market. You know, everyone thinks that we're going to socially engineer people to buy what we want to give them. Reality is, is that there are people that want larger houses. Mm -hmm. it's, that's just reality, that's a market. Unless we're gonna get into social engineering now and, 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 and say no, no large houses, which I'm certainly not a position I'm putting myself in. Um, <coughs> this is perfectly uh, applicable to this particular location. Thank you, Councillor. So with that, then I may have a motion. We have it on the floor to approve the application with an amendment on how the public submission. So we have that, it was moved to second and all in favor. Electronic vote, please. Thank you, everyone. Then I may have a mover and a seconder. A move again by Councillor Partridge, second by Councillor Clark on the main motion as amended. All in favor? Oh, Councillor Johnson walked out. Sorry. Okay, thank you for that. And now we're going to move on to item 8.3. Thank you, everyone. Is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 1351, 1355, 1359, and 1375 Upper James Street and 1624, 34, 40, and 48 Stone Church Road, East Hamilton, PED 19059 is Ward 8. Again, members of the public in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the council 
of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding the zoning bylaw amendment. The person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, unless, in the opinion of the Tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So again, I'm going to go out to the public. Is there anyone here in the audience wishing to speak to this particular item today? Again, the lands are Upper James and Stone Church Road East. Anyone here? If you could show me with a show of hands. Okay, again, seeing no one in the audience, uh, sorry. Did, is there someone here wishing to speak to this item? No? Thank you. Okay, so um, seeing that we have no one here, did you wish to, uh, can I make, please have a motion to close off the floor? Moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Yes. Carried. And then now, do you wish to waive staff presentation? And Councillor Danko wishes to hear staff presentation, so if I can please have you come down, George. Sorry, thank you. The Coles Notes version. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, Madam Chairman, I just want to remind the committee that Mr. Thorne had declared a conflict of interest in this matter, and that's why he stepped away. Um, and secondly, I believe there's a, one of the, uh, the women sitting in the media row waved and indicated she may want to speak to it. I don't know if, you caught, if she caught your eye or not. Uh, sitting did, beside the I, spectator report. I, I looked over and asked again. She was waving the did second Do you wish time? to speak to this item? I'm sorry, I'm not sure of your name in the media row. Is the, ma did you wish to speak to this? Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Robichaud. Councillor Whitehead? I think I just heard that uh, um, that uh, there was a staff person that's declared a conflict and uh, and I don't know what the nature of that conflict is, cause, so can, I, can we put this out in public record, what the nature of the conflict is? Uh, to you, Madam Chairman, my understanding is that Mr. Thorne has family members and friends who live in the immediate vicinity of this property and to avoid any perception of a conflict of interest, he, did he wanted to be excused from any discussion, so he did not sign off on the final report and I believe he had sent out an email to the city manager and to the chair of planning committee earlier when the application was brought to his attention indicating that position. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, thank you for that as well. You're on, George, thank okay, you. Okay, great, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, members of committee, staff, and public in, in attendance, good morning. I will be discussing the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for the lands located at 1351, 1355, 1359 and 1375 Upper James Street, which also includes 1624, 34, 40, and 48 Stone Church Road East, Hamilton. So the subject lands are located at the southeast corner of Stone Church Road East and Upper James Street. As you can see from the aerial, the lands are irregular in shape uh, with a frontage of approximately 171 meters at that 171 meters uh, along Stone Church Road East, a broken 57 one meters along Upper James Street, and a depth of approximately 106 meters, and it's approximately 1.7 hectares in total area. <clears throat> the area shows the subject lands and surrounding uses, and to the south is existing commercial here, as well as here. Uh, to the east is a single detached dwelling, as well as single detached dwellings here. Commercial here, uh, which is a Tim Hortons. Uh, a commercial use here, as well as uh, a church and cemetery here. So again, the properties 34, 40, and 48 Stone Church Road East are currently zoned C, Urban Protected Residential District, and AA Agricultural District within the City of Hamilton Zoning Bylaw 6593, which you can see, Madam Chair, is here. The C Urban Protected Residential District permits single detached dwellings, a foster home, residential care facility or retirement home, a day nursery, a school, a library, as well as other public uses. The AA uh, Agricultural District permits a single detached dwelling, a foster home, a hospital and a private stable as well as other public uses. 
And the properties at 1351, 1355, 1359, and 1375 Upper James Street, as well as 16 and 24 Stone Church Road East, are currently zoned mixed use, medium density C5 318 zone within the city's 05200 bylaw, which you can see here, outlined here in this hashing. The mixed use medium density C5 318 zone permits multiple dwellings, office uses, personal services, restaurant and retail uses, as well as other commercial related uses. So again, this is just for a zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, an official plan amendment is not required. Uh, the, the lands are identified neighborhoods uh, for 34, 40, and 48 Stone Church Road East and primary corridor for, and community node for 1624 Stone Church Road East and the remaining Upper James Street addresses. It's also designated on Schedule E1 of the UHOP neighborhoods for 34 and 40 and 48 Stone Church Road East and mixed use medium density for 1624 uh, Stone Church Road East and the remaining Upper James Street addresses. Also note that the subject lands are located on a potential rapid transit line or blast per Appendix B major transportation facilities and routes. So again, Madam Chair, no official plan amendment is required. It's consistent with the PPS, conforms to a place to grow plan 2019, and conforms to the city's UHOP. Just to give you a little bit of background chronology, since it, you may have noticed it's a 2011 uh, file. So the applicant's original submission was for an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment uh, back in 2011 to permit 13 three-story townhouses two 12-story multiple dwellings with a two-story mixed-use uh, podium, as well as a three one-story commercial buildings. So uh, when I got on the file, it was back in 2017 for the sec second submission, and after meetings with city staff, the applicants resubmitted for an eight-story mixed-use building with commercial uses on the ground floor at the corner of Upper James and Stone Church and three, and sorry, four, three and four story multiple dwellings on the easterly portion of the subject property. So adjustments were eliminated and the need for an official plan amendment was no longer required. A third submission came in in January 2019 uh, after <clears throat> response to city staff comments. Uh, the applicants and their agents were very cooperative throughout the whole process working with city staff. And the applicant further revised the subject proposal to maintain the eight story mixed use building or proposed two four-story multiple dwellings on the easterly portion of the subject property. And this concept was later refined uh, to today to address various staff uh, comments and concerns. So again, just to walk you through the, uh, the site plan quickly. So at the corner is the mixed use eight-story building. Uh, it should be noted that the building was be stepped back four meters from Upper James Street at the seventh and eighth story, as well as six meters at the seventh and eighth story from Stone Church Road East. Here's the outline of the building here. The two multiple dwellings are here, building B outlined here, and building C along with surface parking and underground parking. So just some stats again. The area of the subject lands is 1.7 hectares. The total number of units are proposed are 358 units. Building A, the mixed use eight story building, is, will be uh, 220 units and buildings B and C, 69 units each. There will be amenity areas provided. I don't know why I can never get this working. There we go. Uh, at the second story, <laughs> approximately 900 square meters for the uh, residents of the mixed-use building, and approximately 3,000 square meters here for the uh, residents of the multiple dwellings. Excuse me, 473 total parking spaces are to be provided, 113 uh, surface parking spaces and 360 below grades parking spaces, two loading spaces, one for each building, so here, for the eight-story mixed-use building and here for the multiple dwellings. 
Uh, waste collection will be stored indoors. And another, uh, something that should be noted is that a right in, right out will only be located access onto Upper James Street and the full movement access onto Stone Church Road East. So just the proposed elevations. So the north elevation for the eight story mixed use building is located on the top there. And just underneath on the right is the west elevation for Upper James Street. Elevations for buildings B and C, probably one to note is the one at the top for the north elevation or Stone Church Road East is right at the top. Just to uh, orient yourself around the property, this is uh, me looking north along Upper James Street, standing at the corner of the subject property. You can see the commercial on both sides across the street. I'm looking east along Stone Church Road East here. Uh, looking west along Stone Church Road East, you can see the church across the street at, at the other side or the west side of Stone Church and Upper James. And looking south along Upper James Street here with commercial on the right and the church would be on the right of that picture. And I'm standing across the street looking at the subject property from Upper James Street here. And looking at the subject property from Stone Church Road East from across the street uh, by the Tim Hortons. So just some concerns uh, were brought forth from residents at the information meeting uh, held in November 2017, as well as uh, the letters. So some concerns were raised regarding the use and form of the subject proposal. Uh, in response, the subject proposal will provide a range of housing types for the neighborhood, as well as proposed retail and ser service commercials at grade, all contributing to a complete community. Type of tenure is not known at this time or has been determined. However, uh, it has been indicated by the applicant uh, that it could be condominium tenure and a future draft plan of condominium application will be required. Traffic access were, uh, concerns were raised uh, with respect to the amount of traffic being generated as a result of the subject pr proposal. In support the proposed development, the applicant submitted a traffic impact study prepared by Paradigm Transportation Solutions, which was reviewed by Transportation Planning. Uh, in summary, Transportation Planning found the churning plans and level of increased vehicles acceptable. And of course, the, the proposed development will be subject to site plan control, uh, where the development will be reviewed in greater detail. So uh, concerns came in, uh, of course, when it was a 12-story uh, building. Uh, and further concerns came in uh, regarding height and setbacks. So again, the proposed eight-story mixed-use building proposes a step back from Upper James Street and Stone Church Road East. Again, four meters along Upper James Street and six meters along Stone Church Road East. In addition, the proposed mixed-use building will be set back 4.5 meters from the existing two-story building which is in the little cutout donut there, and will be uh, set back, or the multiple dwellings will be set back 13.1 meters from the existing two-story dwelling at 54 Stone Church Road East, uh, which is here. Actually, that resident was here this morning but had to run off. So a shadow impact study was submitted for the 12-story proposal, uh, showing the greatest impact on the single detached dwellings uh, it was later revised for the eight-story proposal, but again, the greatest impact was uh, during December at 4 p.m. Um, so the proposed development was reduced in building height from 12 stories to eight stories, and again, in December at 4 p.m., the shadows are elongated towards here, the existing development along Stone Church Road East. Uh, 
So again, it was brought down in height, which would minimize the effects of shadow, shadow and overview of existing properties. And again, uh, there are proposed setbacks on the eight-story building. So in, in conclusion, Madam Chair, staff are recommending approval to rezone the subject lands to the mixed-use, medium-density C5-724 zone for lands located at this is a mouthful, 1351, 1355, 1359, 1375 Upper James Street, and 1624, 34, 40, and 48 Stone Church Road East to permit an eight story mixed use building and two four story multiple dwellings. It should also be noted that the by proposed bylaw restricts uh, commercial uses uh, only to be permitted on the ground floor of the eight story building. So only the building A here. Commercial uses are not permitted in buildings B and C. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, George. Councillor Danko, questions on the uh, presentation? Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, George, for the, the presentation and all your, your hard work on this file over the years. I know it's been, uh, it's been uh, quite a, quite a, uh, a journey. Um, so just uh, some of the comments that we've received from the public, most of them uh, relate to Barton Stone Church and the impact, in, the impact on that property and the use of that property. Um, considering its historic value and also its use as a, as a current church with the, the congregation. Um, could you touch on that? Um, yeah, and I did see some correspondence this morning. I may have to defer to Heritage uh, staff too, but as I understand it, uh, cultural heritage impact assessment is only required if you are adjacent or uh, on a property that's designated uh, within the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, so this, the church is across the street uh, it is a major commercial arterial, so, um, and if one looks at the shadow impacts, uh, the impacts on the church are negligible. Again, most of the impacts of the shadow are on, or to the south, to the southeast uh, during the winter. So, um, yeah, otherwise I would have to uh, defer to Heritage Plain. There's also concerns on traffic and right. um, access to you know, the, the church property if we're bringing in more people into this area. So again, through the chair, um, the access is limited on, along Upper James Street to right in, right out, uh, which would hopefully uh, create less issues on Upper James. And again, uh, limited to the full movement on only on Stone Church Road East. Last question is just on the, the building height. So the proposed building A is eight stories. Um, we're proposing a C5 zone for the, the whole site, correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, and C5 allows for a six-story height as of right up to eight with um, certain provisions. Can you just go through the provisions that this building meets? And That's correct. So um, the official plan permits uh, up to eight stories as long as there's no shadow adverse impacts and the buildings are progressively stepped back uh, from adjacent areas, designated neighborhoods, as well as step back uh, from the street to minimize uh, the height of the uh, building from the street or the appearance of the height. Thank you, and I think it's just important to point out that we did start at 12 stories and we ended up to something that does fit within the zoning for the, for the site, which is, you know, as, as we move forward with different applications throughout the city, I think that this serves as a, as a good, um, maybe model where the developers work within what the zoning is going to be. Is that a fair Through the chair, I would say that's a fair assessment. I, from what I understand, it was even higher, the original concept, more like uh, Miss Saga kind of, Marilyn Monroe building kind of thing. Thank you, George. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I've had the, uh, the privilege, um, because I wasn't a councillor here for a couple of these I think it originally started with the, 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 the major tower, the Mississauga uh, iconic uh, uh, tower, and I believe Scott DeVell was running. And so that was, there was a gap where I was filling in for that side of the ward. And then, of course, in the second uh, go round on this stage, I was attending the meetings uh, and consultation. I don't know if I saw, I don't think JP was there uh, in November, but I was there, uh, and there's probably about 30 people in the room. It appears that most of the issues are the traditional issues, uh, uh, height and den uh, density and, and traffic. But uh, it certainly seemed to me in the, in, in the discussion that a lot of the, the stuff could be dealt with through site plan. And 
the traffic piece, well, I mean, this is an arterial road, Upper James is an arterial road, Stone Church is an arterial road. So those arguments often, um, in regards to uh, the, 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 the transportation analysis, never uh, fall on the side of uh, uh, these kind of developments having a greater impact, because, I mean, those roads were designed for pretty significant impacts to start with. And the last piece is, this is the A-line on Upper James. I mean, I, actually, I think it should be taller, but quite frankly, I think that when you look at nodes and corridors, uh, we made, made this argument on uh, James Street North uh, last week, uh, and I don't think we should be uh, spared from that same principle and philosophy, is that when you have major uh, uh, transportation corridors, you're looking for uplift. You're looking to create the type of density to utilize your public transit system, make it more viable, and then use those dollars to expand that service, again, to be more uh, climate friendly, um, then you need to take advantage of those um, circumstances as they prevail. So I would wish this was a little higher than the eight stories, quite frankly. Um, but having said that, I certainly support what's uh, before us here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So with that, then, um, we have a motion to receive George's presentation. Moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Whitehead. All in favour? Thank you. Thank you, George. George do I have uh, Jennifer Armiston? of Mainline Planning uh, Services, Inc. in attendance, or represent, come on down, please, and you're gonna have to state your support of the staff recommendation. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, my name is Joseph Platino. I am the principal mainline planning services, acting as agent for uh, AR Riccio Developments. Um, first of all, I want to begin by thanking George for his uh, presentation and thanking staff for all the hard work they've done. Uh, we consider it a team effort on this application. We're very pleased uh, to have worked uh, diligently with staff. I've reviewed his report. Uh, my considered planning opinion of, uh, I'm 32 me years member of, uh, a reg as a registered professional planner, my, uh, my considered opinion is that uh, I support uh, all of the uh, testimony made by George with respect to uh, his planning comments. Um, I have Jennifer Ormiston here with me today. She's a junior planner with my firm. Uh, she's a candidate for professional status and uh, I would uh, hope that you would indulge her. A very brief presentation. We've timed it at about three minutes, so uh, just so she can get some experience as well. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Ormiston and I'm a junior planner at Mainline Planning Services. The zoning bylaw amendment that is before you today is a legacy file. It was originally submitted in 2011 and proposed a high density development component that is contrary to the in-force official plan. The original plan focused on, a, focused on the development of two 14-story high density apartment towers on a single commercial podium. The concept was amended in 2015 with additional lands, when additional lands were acquired by the owner and the high density component was reduced in height to 12 stories. The concept also did not conform to the enforced official plan and proposed three driveway entrances off of Stone Church Road. The latest development proposal is a medium density mixed use development that conforms to the enforced official plan. The current plan removes the high density housing component in favor of an eight story mixed use residential commercial building that, and moves the mid rise building to the intersection of Upper James and Stone Church Road. 
creating a streetscape that is inviting for pedestrians. Two community meetings have been held for the subject development, and although today's public meeting is the first statutory public meeting for this application, the adjacent residents and interested members of public have had a couple of opportunities to discuss the project and express their concerns. Notably, the January 2018 community meeting was well attended by residents and counselors, specifically Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Skelly. We presented a similar iteration of the current proposal and listened to resident concerns and comments. Particularly, the most current site plan considers concerns regarding access to Stone Church Road. Since the 2015 plan, the current proposal reduces the number of entrances on Stone Church Road from three to one. The proposed entrance is evenly spaced between the intersection and the adjacent neighborhood, providing safe traffic flow in and out of the site. Additionally, the driveway entrance on Upper James Street will be right in and right out to optimize traffic flow and minimize adverse impacts. The modifications proposed by the bylaw are specifically to implement the development that adheres to the city's design guidelines for this community node and includes a reduced setback to street lines to create a pedestrian friendly transition to commercial uses and the rapid bus tra transit platform emergency stair access encroachments leading to the underground parking garage, a building height exception to conform with the permitted height of the mixed use building in the official plan, and um, amendment to permit a minor reduction in the number of parking and loading spaces to reflect emerging policy and the proposed boutique size commercial uses of this development. The evolution of the proposed development to its current form included consideration of resident comments as well as fulfilling all of the needs and requests of every city department and agency. The result is a collaborative process spanning nearly two years to produce a site-specific bylaw that implements the city's design guidelines and supports the high quality of development that is envisioned by the city's official plan for this specific site. We've worked tirelessly with city staff to create a development that will allow the residents of Hamilton to live, work, and play in, in all of the same location. It is our considered opinion that your support of staff's report and recommendation to approve this bylaw will result in a landmark development that we can all be proud of. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and we hope that staff's recommendation will be supported by this committee and brought to council next week. Thank you, Jennifer, great job. Um, so again, uh, really wanna commend you and, and Joe and Mainline on your work on this, this project. I know it's, it, it's been um, a challenge at, time, at times. I know it hasn't been easy, um, but I, I think, and, and I know you are really proud of where we've, we've ended up. Although looking at Angelo's face when Councillor Whitehead was suggesting hire was, was kind of funny. Um, just the follow-up question, same as, as I asked George about the concerns with Barton Stone Church. I know you saw the correspondence uh, just recently and, and you had a response to that, Joe, um, if you'd like to elaborate that, on that at all. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, that the, uh, the church is pro a protected heritage property uh, in the municipality and the bylaw specifically has identified the attributes that reflect um, preservation uh, issues as being the pastoral context of the property, the fence pillars that are constructed from the original stone fence, the mature trees on the property along Upper Jane Street, the attributes that reflect uh, the Gothic revival style of architecture is also important, which includes the church, uh, the gable roof, the cornice returns, the paired Gothic, arch windows and the arch door and the east facade, and the attributes that reflect the value <clears throat> of the historic cemetery, which is the, uh, the tomb headstones and their arrangement. Um, I've reviewed the official plan. I've reviewed the policies with respect uh, to heritage preservation. Um, they appear to apply, as George indicated, to adjacent properties and uh, for the protection of the resource on the property. So it's really an argument, uh, not an argument, but uh, uh, a bylaw that preserves what's there, uh, protects it from destruction or modification. And uh, if something is going to displace 
a heritage resource, uh, an adjacent development, for example, that is immediately adjacent, then a CHIA report would be required. In, uh, I've, I've observed, uh, as I studied the file, uh, when I received it in 2016, uh, that there was comments from the Heritage Department. Um, they said that uh, a CHIA could be considered. Uh, however, we replied to that in our planning justification report and, uh, uh, and through the submissions of our architectural people. Um, and quite frankly, I don't know if you... Uh, we do have a, a, a picture if you will, that shows the shadow study um, that was done on the eight-story building. Um, the sun rises in the east, which is, uh, if you look at uh, Upper James Road as being planned north and south, um, it would come up in the southeast of the building and project a shadow in the morning um, to the northeast, uh, which falls, as you can see here, um, in front of the church and on the road. So the, the, the impact of a shadow would be negligible on the church in the sense that uh, the front door of the church has no windows. Uh, you can see that the rest of the property in the worst case scenario is bright, uh, uh, bathed with sunlight. Uh, by noon, the shadow moves east. So as you can see, it's already at the intersection. Um, I took the time, uh, we've used the Barton Church uh, for our public meetings, and I took the time to look at their um, schedules. Uh, they, they conduct their worship or mass at 10.30 a.m., one single mass every Sunday uh, between September and June. Then they don't celebrate mass and again for, for two months and come back to September. So, as you can see, um, I believe that uh, the conclusion was that a CHIA wouldn't be required uh, as there is no uh, impact on the Stone Church or the grounds. Thank you, Joe, and, and for such a, a thorough um, investigation of the, the impacts on that, on that very important property. And uh, once again, thanks for your work on this file. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have just uh, one question. So. What's the total number of units for all of the buildings? I believe it's in the order of 353, is it? And the number of parking spots for residents only? And then the number of parking spots for visitors, please. Each unit would have a parking space. So 353 parking spaces because there's 353 units. And is there visitor parking? Visitor parking is not required under the C5 bylaw for multiple dwellings or mixed use buildings. Thank you. Big change from what we talked about a few weeks ago, isn't it, downtown? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So may I please have a motion to receive the presentation, moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. And now on the report, well, first off, uh, I, did I close off to the floor, Madam Clerk? You have that, thank you. So I'm, then I'm going to go, I have a motion regarding the staff report to approve the application with an amendment that uh, the uh, submissions received did not affect the decision, moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Or, sorry, question? It's on the floor. Okay, Councillor Danko, you want to speak to it now? Yes, if I may, just uh, <clears throat> some comments on, on this uh, application, if you can, you'll indulge me. Um, this, this development in particular is, is quite important for Ward 8 and for all the Hamilton Mountains. So I'm going to take a little bit of time here and, and kind of go through it. Um, Upper James is the predominant commercial corridor on the mountain. And this development really sets the stage for the scale, the quality, the built form that uh, we as a city are trying to promote on, on some of our busiest and somewhat under, underutilized um, urban arterial roadways. 
Uh, our planning staff has just done a, a fantastic job on this development, as George alluded to. It's been quite a journey since 2011. Uh, so George Yvette, everyone on planning, thank you for your, your work on this. Uh, as well as the proponents, um, Jennifer Joe at Mainline, and, uh, and of course the developer, um, Angelo, uh, who's, who has been open to and receptive to actually negotiating with our staff and working through all these problems um, instead of just trying to, to bully through and build something that wouldn't be appropriate for the site. Um, again, if you look back on the history of this project, it started with uh, submissions in 2011 and uh, with a few tall towers, some small townhouses, a couple of kind of strip mall developments, which I think clearly wouldn't have been appropriate for the site. And uh, working through that, I, I know it wasn't easy. It took a long time, but I really do believe that this development is a very good fit for that corner and uh, is as close to what we could um, ideally project for that location is, is what's really possible or what we could reasonably expect. Um, just some of the details on the proposed development, C5 mixed use, medium density really is the perfect fit for that corner. If you think about Upper James, again, as that urban arterial corridor, Stone Church is a minor arterial. Um, having that main floor commercial space and then residential intensification above it is a, is a great fit for that area. Um, as, as George alluded to, Upper James is slated for A-line rapid transit. So thinking ahead to when there is a future LRT stop at that corner, which, which there will be, Upper James and Stone Church, um, as a designated community node, our, um, our plan density for that area, I believe, is 100 persons and jobs per hectare. This development is actually going to provide 200 persons and jobs per hectare, so it's, it's exactly the kind of urban infill development and economic uplift that we are trying to promote and that we need along our prime transit and transportation corridors. And the reason is, as everybody around this, this table knows, is shifting that uh, residential property tax from the existing rate pairs onto new development and new commercial space. Um, question from Councillor Clark on the, the parking. Uh, there's a total of 477 parking spots for 373 residential units. And uh, I appreciate the, the uh, question about visitor parking, but with the commercial use there, there are parking spots above and beyond uh, a one-to-one -one ratio. And I think the best thing about it is that about three quarters of the parking is, is underground. So it's not a giant surface parking lot. The, uh, the owner and the planners have, have gone through and actually you know, built that into the development that it's, it's underground parking, um, which aesthetically is, is a huge step forward, especially for an area like this. Um, on the height, the C5 zoning we've already touched on, um, the developer was able to work within the zoning, um, what's permitted under C5 for an eight-story um, building. And, and I think that's really important to note to mention because you know they could have pushed for nine, they could have pushed for ten, um, but they worked within the zoning that we have that we're putting in place for this property. And, and the C5 zone, just to point out, is most of Upper James is uh, is is zoned for C5. So what we set in place here will carry through for the majority of the rest of that corridor. Um, the main floor commercial retail, I, I mean, this is, it's not a, a disposable strip mall. This is purpose-built commercial space that's density-oriented, and it, it, it really serves to act um, in a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with the density that we're building and that we're trying to promote and the commercial corridor that, it, that it's on. So the, the two work together by building and increasing the density in the area, we're, we're bringing in the opportunity for new commercial development, which is, which is exactly what we're, we're trying to promote. Um, and then finally, there's the, the scale of the design. And again, the, I think the planners and the architects have, have put a lot of, of good care and effort into this. Um, the site isn't overbuilt. It's the massing fits with the, with the urban node that, uh, that we're trying to promote. The transitions to the existing neighborhood have been taken into account as, it, as the buildings um, go to a four-story as you get closer to the existing neighborhood. 
And uh, it's street oriented, so it's designed to add to the public realm. And there's, there's street level green space, and there's also green space between the buildings and the, the courtyards. So um, I think special care has been put into that to try to make sure that this development is, is we end up with the built form that we're trying to promote at exactly this location. So obviously I support this development. Um, and I think right now in, in our office we have at least a dozen developments in different stages of, uh, of uh, completion and application um, for the Upper James Corridor, for West Fifth, for uh, you know, the, those main mountain arterial roadways. And I think this development serves as, this is, I really think is gonna kick off a lot of that development moving forward. And this, this development now is something that we can point back to and say, okay, yeah, yeah, you're proposing 15 stories or 10 stories or this massing or that massing. We can point back to this development as saying, well, we can work through those issues, we can work through those problems and get something that is almost universally supported. So um, thank you for your indulgence and uh, very supportive of this proposal and I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting the shovels in the ground. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think I heard Councillor Danko say that there were 477 parking spots in total, is that correct? But there's no visitors parking and the difference would be that it, part of it is commercial and obviously visitors could park there, is, is the, the summation. Um, so a question for staff then. So I'm looking at this property, it's on the A line, it's on the transit corridors, two transit corridors, and I compare all of the discussion we had with the one on James Street, which had 59 residential units and only 32 parking, and we were told that it was because it was on excellent transit corridors. How come we didn't push back on parking here then if we push back so strenuously on the James Street one that we're now headed to an appeal on? Staff supported the concept of 59 units, 32 parking spots, bike parking. Here we have one that's on a major transit corridor, two major transit corridors, and yet there seemed to be no pushback from staff on the amount of parking that's being put in here. Every unit has a parking spot, and yet if that was the case and that was the principle we had on James Street down below, it would have been 59 parking spots. I'm trying to understand the principles that we're applying when we're looking at parking along transit corridors. Uh, through you, Madam oh. Chairman. Uh, generally, we start at the assumption that they should comply with the bylaw requirements for parking based on the unit size. If they're smaller units, it's 0.3 parking spaces per unit. And if they're larger units, i.e. over 50 square meters, it's one parking space per unit. And then we look at what's the total required parking under the, very, under the zoning bylaw. If the proponent is looking at an alternative parking standard, usually which is less than what's required, then it's an assessment as to what's the appropriateness of that uh, alternative standard, looking at um, based on the information that's available. So we have gone as you know down to that approximate 0.6 is generally seen as the lowest. That 0.6 is based on, excuse me, fighting a bit of a head cold. That point six comes from some of the information from the Transportation Tomorrow Survey, and we we're in the process of updating that, which showed that within the former city of Hamilton, generally we were looking at 0.65 cars per apartment or multiple dwelling unit. So that's how we're sort of assessing the impact and then those locational characteristics. So although the bylaw represents the standard, uh, if someone is proposing an alternative standard, then we wanna see what the justification is. We work with our transportation planning staff as well as our parking staff to then determine the appropriateness of, of that st alternative standard. In this case, the applicant was not seeking to reduce the standard. They were proposing to comply with the bylaw requirements as it relates to parking for both the residential and the commercial components. They exceeded the standard. They provided more parking than was required. Uh, that is generally yes, in this case they are looking at providing that and part of that op often what we are finding is even if we were to eliminate parking, it's site characteristics and market demand. So we're still finding that situation even in the lower city. There are areas where proponents have come in at a lower standard than what the bylaw would normally require 
and then through the marketing and sales of that development, they find that they actually have to start providing additional parking because people still, while well, in the urban areas, they may not use their car as frequently. The rate of car ownership doesn't actually decline in some of those urban areas. So we're still finding that uh, some, they are looking at providing more parking that's required. I'm just thinking uh, some of the city square development that was New Horizon Homes, they actually came in to increase the parking on site in their later phases because they found during the sales and marketing, people still wanted a spot to park their car, although they may be able to walk, cycle, or use transit for most of the majority of their trips. That's, that's very helpful, and I, and I appreciate that, and, and I support the application. I, I think it makes sense completely. I don't object to it. I just found the inconsistency in some of the debate that we had in the last little while here, especially around this table, and a little bit of the abuse my colleague took in, in, in his ward uh, unnecessary, because at the end of the day, we really do recognize that there's still an issue. People want parking. They need parking, um, and we have to make sure that we're hitting that right ratio. It's a challenge hitting that right ratio. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, you are correct. And that is why, uh, just as a reminder of the committee, that we are bringing forward the discussion paper on parking standards for new, uh, as part of the new zoning bylaw and looking at that as to what is an appropriate standard and is it a one size fits all standard or should we start looking at saying what is the standard and then in areas where we could look at a, a reduction to that standard. So if you're directly adjacent to an LRT corridor, those areas may warrant a reduced standard, but in those suburban locations that are still very car dependent or will continue to be car dependent going forward, then what should that standard be and having consultation and then coming back to this committee for a decision, a staff recommendation and decision as to what those new parking standards should be in the residential zoning bylaw on a go forward basis. And we hope to bring that forward uh, within this, uh, the discussion paper by the end of this year. Look forward to that, Mr. Robichaud. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, sir. Councillor Whitehead. That was one comment I was going to make directly, and that was the, the, the fact that I don't, I've never been a big supporter of a standard when it came to, to parking, understanding that there's so many other variables that need to be considered uh, in the context of parking that makes sense, especially with uh, an evolving society. And to suggest that uh, a, a geographic area in the city that uh, is fairly significant distance between the amenities and, and, and the residents uh, where, and, and not a high quality of transit uh, versus one that's got a high quality of standard frequency and dependability and so forth, that's a, those, those need to be weighed in into the conversation and, uh, and, and obviously the growing trend. So I really appreciate those comments. That's, it's, it's absolutely dead on. Um, but it does uh, beg the question, um, we are, are in the process of, and, and have on many occasions, we did on Stone Church, um, allowing uh, uh, secondary units uh, in houses. Um, and we're saying no parking requirement. Now I'm, I'm getting to see, on the very one that we proved recently, uh, impacts of those decisions because those people got cars. They have cars, especially again, back to the, 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 the variables we talked about, where you're putting these places, where are they relative to a transit line, all those other considerations. I don't know if we realize um, the impacts uh, by saying zero parking when those applications come. So you can have two, depending on the size of your home, you maybe have two units, but certainly one. You're adding a, a car in a, in a semi-detached, semi-detached home with a driveway that only fits one car. Where's that other car go? On a busy arterial road. Where's it go? So I think we need to have a better look at the, 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 the consequences. Uh, again, I don't think one shoe fits all. I just want to ensure that we understand these other variables that need to be considered when we approve these, uh, these type of approach going forward. I also uh, want to commend uh, uh, Councillor Danko and his articulation of his support behind this uh, project. I don't think I could have done even close as good job as he did. Maybe that's probably his engineering background, but he did an incredible job. Um, I actually uh, had the opportunity to sit through, um, uh, sit through many conversations uh, and meetings uh, in, in respect to the transition there. Like I said, it just happened that the gaps of when the, a lot of these conversations were taking place, somehow I was uh, foisted into the, the conversations because of circumstances. And uh, again, no, uh, the last meeting I attended, I think part of it was uh, not that it wasn't some, but I wasn't sure where I was running. Right, it was a running in the, in the, in the Ward 8 side, it was running in 14, so I thought I'd better attend the meeting and, and uh, certainly uh, 
it started with a, the super tower with a lot of Ward 8 residents and what the people I currently still represent, not now, sorry, but I was represented at that time, were really concerned about the impacts of a super tower uh, and, and of course they live across the street. So, uh, so I was very uh, um, involved with it, but I gotta say that I've been to a lot of development meetings and uh, this was a picnic compared to some uh, other meetings I attend uh, on development. So the community for the most part uh, and the residents were very responsive, uh, responsible and uh, constructive uh, uh, with their, uh, their concerns. Uh, I was so pleased with that. And uh, so I'm 100% I'm, I'm behind, behind the application. Thank you, everyone. With that, then, um, I have a motion to approve the staff report um, with the amendment that no uh, submissions received. Submissions received did not affect the decision. And, um, and uh, that's it. So it's moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. Then we have on the main motion as amended. Moved again by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor? Thank you. Carries, thank you everyone. Item 6-4 has been removed, Madam Clerk, thank you. Thank you, and um, I'm going on to item 8-4. And I guess Councillor Clark did just come up to speak to me. And uh, Councillor Clark, did you wish to question again? This is the item with regards to the accessory. Sorry. Because of 10 1 has been moved to become 8 4. So the attachments are listed as 10 1, but it is officially now item 8 4. Apologize for the confusion. Okay, so 8 4 is the accessory dwelling units pilot project. Temporary use bylaw for City of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 6593, PED 19176, wards 1 and 8. I know Councillor Clark questioned this at the beginning, and I also have a concern, and I asked staff previously, but I have a concern with the way the report is worded. So, Councillor Clark, I'll ask you to go ahead first. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate this, and I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. So, I asked at the beginning of the committee in order for me to determine whether or not I had a conflict, whether or not the recommendations were going to be party to the licensing of rental housing. And I heard the assurances that no, they were two separate issues, and yet when I'm looking at 10.1, now 8.4, under the recommendations, it says as part of the low density rental housing licensing pilot project. Right. So I'm really confused now. We're supposed to be talking about secondary units, in a pilot for awards one to eight, but it seems to be directly attached to a pilot on licensing of rental housing in wards one to eight. And if that is the case, then I have a conflict. And I don't understand why the two are connected. Because substantively, they're not. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, maybe the, um, the rationale why we're bringing this forward was because of the conversations and discussions relating to the licensing project and the ongoing stakeholder engagement. And in that engagement, um, the issue of the current zoning bylaw provisions as they relate to accessory apartments could be an impediment to the creation or the legalization of existing apartments. Staff are currently, we're working on a white paper and dis background discussion paper on accessory apartments in that we will be looking at revising those regulations or bringing forward options under section for accessory apartments. But the decision today is this is simply to hold a public meeting to consider these changes to the zoning bylaw, but not to make necessary any decisions on the proposed changes to the zoning bylaw, nor to make any decisions as it relates to the licensing of rental housing. I understand, so I think although the, so the need to make changes to the accessory apartment regulations came through the licensing discussion, but we're not recommending anything as it relates to licensing through this report. I don't know if that provides any clarity for the councillor or not. It, 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 it doesn't, I mean, because you're, you're, you're saying it's a part of the licensing pilot project in your report. Thank you. 
And so that immediately excludes myself and anyone else that's involved with rental housing specifically. And so I, I, I just don't understand how you can have a substantive discussion about ancillary use and secondary use, a pilot for wards one and eight, and connect that directly to a licensing pilot. They're two different things. One is a regulatory situation, one is, is zoning and, and as of right legislation. And by to putting two together, you've ostensibly cut me out of the discussion. And that's fine, I understand, but I don't understand why it was done that way. Yeah, so through the chair, so, so as, as Mr. Robichaud said, the, the, the reason it was done that way was when we were last in front of committee on the, on the licensing aspect, uh, this issue of um, uh, the zoning standards around uh, secondary units came up as a significant issue. So we've been looking at that through a zoning lens. Uh, we have been looking at it citywide um, as part of the residential zoning initiative. That's not going to be ready in the, in the near term. Uh, so we made the decision to, to bring forward as this pilot project um, for just these two wards, uh, these, these zoning changes. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I, I can't advise in terms of what that might mean in terms of a potential conflict. Uh, what you have for you right now is the, our zoning changes, um, but they are zoning changes. The impetus behind them was the discussions that were had around the licensing uh, issue. Uh, that's why it's being brought forward as, a, as temporary use. That's why it's being brought forward for wards one and eight, um, is that it's um, uh, the, 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 the catalyst behind it was the discussions around licensing. Uh, but the report you have in front of you only relates to zoning. And that's unfortunate. Madam Chair, I have to declare conflict for the Planning Committee, September 17th, 19, 10.1 accessory dwelling units, uh, licensing rental housing pilot. I have a non-pecuniary indirect apparent conflict as I have a previous relationship with the HDAA as a former client and as I wrote the report promoting code compliant, affordable, safe, clean and healthy rental housing. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Johnson, I'm going to go through the speaker's list and then I will follow at the end of a, as a comment. Actually, it's for questions for staff regarding the report. So I'll go back off. If you can please come back to me. It's just after you get this resolved, I'd like to talk to the staff about the okay, report so I, 10.1 I, or 8.4 now. I think the easiest way for me to resolve it is, Madam Clerk, I'm going to ask for a form as well and I will declare a conflict as a landlord and I will relinquish the chair to the vice chair, Councillor Farr, if he would like to come up and deal with this and I'll leave the room and come back. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, when the, 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 the journey started, um, the genesis for it was, in fact, the, the, the significant challenges between uh, in Ward 1 and Ward 8. Yes. Um, it's hard. You know, I, I said, two, said two words, and already I've been questioned if I'm speaking to the report. I, I, I find that really surprising. That's fair, that's fair. Okay, so Councillor Johnson's gonna go, she had a quick question and then I'll come to you, Councillor Whitehead, okay? If you're thank you. trying um, back in, Councillor Whitehead. And thank you very much, sorry, I was, just, I was just wondering where we were at in the process, I thought we were still talking about conflicts. Um, so my question through you, Chair, to the staff, uh, Timothy Lee, I guess, wrote it. So, Timothy, big question that I had right from the get-go was how do you make something like this temporary? Then I go to 10.1A, or sorry, yep, A, and that's the three questions they were asking. Will units be forced to go back to the current zoning regulations after the three-year proposal and it turns out not to be doing well? Will investments be wasted on this bylaw? And will there be a grandfathering clause added? So, I'm confused why this is even temporary. How do you pull back when you decide it's not working. Through to the chair, um, I will probably answer the first question, why is it temporary? Mm -hmm. um, so the proposed temporary use bylaw uh, is to be in effect for 36 months, and that, this is because it is a bridge. 
It's considered as a bit of a bridge between the regulations that we have now in um, Hamilton zoning bylaw 6593 and the future um, zone regulations that staff is currently proposing as part of the discussion paper uh, and as part of the residential zone project under Hamilton zoning bylaw 05200. So uh, that, that is the reason why for there's, this, there's a uh, temporary use bylaw in effect to provide certain relief uh, to certain some of those regulations under section 19, uh, residential conversion regulations. So theoretically, through you, Chair to Timothy, this is, is posting as a, as a temporary, but this is, as you said, is a bridge to get to the actual, to get it to being permanent, correct? Through you to the, ch oh, through to the chair, um, some of the, uh, the regulation, the proposed uh, modifications under the bylaw um, kind of mirrors some of the regulations that, uh, as being suggested uh, under the future regulations. So for example, the uh, elimination of the 65 square meter um, for minimum 65 square meter dwelling size is not contemplated in the uh, in future residential zoning, um, on, um, future re regulations under in the second dwelling units. And also uh, certain things such as reduction in the minimum lot size requirements as well. So. Um, that's why there's, there's a bit of a bridge and a, a very, I would say almost a similar uh, set of regulations. Then would it be fair to say that this is an interim to get us to that point? Whenever I see pilot project temporary, automatically I assume that if it doesn't work out, we can pull out. And then how do you pull out from something that's already been built, something that's already in the hopper to be built, and uh, how do these houses now stay legal or they become legal non-conforming? Or the units, I should say. So it's just when we're talking about something permanent like this, we're asking people to build or to add on to their homes, whatever. Where's the comfort value for the, for the neighborhood to understand that it's here to stay? You don't, just, you don't just take a petition and then it's gone because we decide to pull out. I don't understand this. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the board councillor. Under the provisions of the Planning Act, when a temporary use bylaw expires, the use does not have legal non-conforming status. So at the end of those 36 months, if the decision of committee and council is not to amend the zoning bylaw on a global basis, then those units would no longer comply with zoning and they would have a couple options either to go to get a minor variance to allow that use to continue or alternatively, assuming we could come forward with essentially a housekeeping amendment to recognize any of those units that were created during obtained building permits and were legally established during that interim period or based on the direction that the province is giving us under Bill 108 and the regulations, I think what where Mr. Lee was suggesting is we are going to need to update our zoning bylaw on a citywide basis to relax the, the requirements for accessory apartments and be more permissive and to bring them into alignment with the requirements of the Ontario Building Code and other provincial requirements. So that is part of that broader citywide conversation we want to have um, either starting in late this year or early next year on what should be accessory apartment regulations. This is just to see this, what's before committee today is a recognition is what we've been hearing is there's existing accessory apartments out there in wards one and eight that do not comply with the zoning bylaw. And by because and rather than the property owner coming forward for a minor variance, if they're not, they am afraid that there may be a third party appeal if they're not successful. We said that these are the two elements, lot size and unit size, that seem to be the biggest areas of contention. It would allow them in this interim measure, while the bylaw is in place, to legalize those apartments and to ensure that they obtain a building permit and they meet basic health and safety concerns until we bring forward so a new citywide global amendments to the zoning bylaw on accessory apartments that'll have a, uh, based on the provincial direction that is supposed to allow an accessory apartment in any single semi or townhouse dwelling unit in the city of Hamilton in accordance with requirements of Bill 108. And, and thank you for that through you, Chair. Um, with all due respect, folks, this to me just convolutes the problem. So if you want this to happen, then why are you making it a pilot project temporary? In my opinion, we're setting up landlords to come in to spend $1,500 at the end of the three years to get a variance, when in fact, we're turning around saying, but for three years you were okay. 
And once we give them the okay to do what they want to do or what they have been doing, then at the end of the three years, we're going to say, oops, you got to come in now $1,500 to make it okay. So this is where I think the, if for me, it's very, very confusing. If you want to change the bylaw, change the bylaw and change it and, and, and permanently. This is a lot of investment for some people. And if we put a bylaw in temporary, that always is that fear at the end of the day that we could pull it because it's not permanent. So how do we resolve, for me, how do I resolve this that I, that, and I'm, these don't affect my ward, so I'm not saying that. I just don't think the process is the way we should be going. It should be either we do it or we don't do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think that was part of the reason why we were proposing just to have a public meeting today to solicit feedback. And if the feedback is that as a temporary use bylaw, it does create uncertainty or okay. risk to the property owners, then when we report back with changes to the zoning bylaw at a future planning committee meeting, that'll be one of the th recommendations or one of the um, issues that we will have to okay. address in that report. So it could, instead of being a temporary use bylaw, it could be that we recognize we make these things or we legalize it in wards one and eight, or we not proceed at, recommend not to proceed until we do a global amendment, or we could proceed with a temporary okay. use bylaw. But the reason why we wanted to schedule today's public meeting was specifically for issues to be raised, hear back from stakeholders or other interested parties, and then all of that information will form the basis of the next planning staff report on this matter. So thank you, and that thank you that now ties it up in a bow for me. Um, I read it as we are, we're we're we're. The shotgun we're just pulling it now instead of spitballing so thank you very much for that explanation and the last question i had was and this was 10.1 um, a dot dot and it talks about the parking where parking's not required and i know we keep coming back to this but when i go to rent or buy a house it's to meet my family's needs or my needs hence i need a spot for one car i need one for two whatever that may be i have my family's needs in mind when i go to rent or buy a home when you rent out a piece of that residence, there's an expectation that parking will be warranted, whether it be by your tenant or by their visitors. So not only you've got visitors coming, now your tenant's gonna have visitors coming. So does that not put more pressure? And maybe this again, we're spitballing, so this is my comments going forward, is that are we not putting pressure now on that street to have overloaded uh, parking that's gonna look like a car lot threw up on it, because you've got all these tenants coming in and they have grandma coming to visit or they've got their friends coming to visit. That doesn't mean that they take the HSR. It doesn't mean that they're taking Uber. It means that they could be coming in by car. So I appreciate the comments that were on that letter. So those are just my comments. Thank you very much for clarifying that for me, Mr. Robichaud. So say for that last bit, you were uh, primarily focused on procedural. Um, the order of things as it uh, happens, um, and I appreciate the questions. And again, A is to be received with the recommendations before us, and B is to be presented to a future planning committee meeting. But uh, the uh, clerk fortunately reminded me that we have a, in a, um, a procedural way, uh, we have to ask members of the public if they would like to speak at this time. And we also have a staff presentation. We can either receive that or waive that. Um, but first, uh, to, uh, and in keeping with the planning procedures, members of the public in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make an oral submission at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding the zoning bylaw amendment, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the local planning uh, appeal tribunal and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. So are there any members of the public today wishing to address committee? Hang on. If you have a procedural question, I'm going to let you go. Okay, perfect. No, while you were getting into the history of rental housing, that's how you opened. Uh, anybody in the public wishing to address committee on this? Third time. Anybody from the public? Nobody. So, seeing as no one has come forward, a motion to close the public meeting. Moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Danko. All in favor? That's carried. I now have a staff presentation, but prior to uh, uh, seeing the will of committee on a staff presentation, I will go to you now, Councillor Whitehead, if you have also procedural questions similar to the speaker before you. Go ahead, sir. 
What I'm trying to fathom, because I mean, obviously I was very, very involved in the rental housing, and it seems that we're mixing issues now. And the issues that we're mixing is that this wasn't about legalizing people that were not legal. This was about bringing them into conformity. And whatever uh, our, our standards are, is the conformity they have to come uh, in, in place with. It wasn't about saying, sorry, we're gonna give you a, a, a complete open uh, shot to continue bringing the apartment without coming into compliance with our current bylaws. So I'm, I'm a bit confused now uh, because on an accessory apartment, for example, you wouldn't need licensing. You wouldn't need licensing. This is for homes or, that'd be converted. The landlord's not living there. These are rental, complete re rental units. So I'm now confused at how we're marrying the concerns of the rental component to, and I understand the broader accessory apartments and, and moving down that road. I don't see the marriage between the two or the, the, the liability or risk between the two because the application of the licensing wasn't to be going after accessory apartments and, and homes. So can I clarification? So staff, would that be answered in a staff presentation? This is procedural, Mr. Chair. Yep, fair enough. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the rental pilot project will deal with all rental properties within wards one and eight, all rental that are in the low density category. Including the ones uh, Including part of this report? Apartments. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really confused because of all the studies and things that I sat around that table, it, it really is addressing absentee landlords, uh, absentee la uh, uh, landlords rent, uh, renting uh, out uh, units in our community and they, they, uh, they fall in, Ill re in repair. There was no ever any evidence of people actually living in a home renting out uh, an apartment needed to licensing. So you were there, I was there, you tell me, I'll, I'll back off where that evidence came from. So we've. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we've uh, developed a database of rental properties that have been advertised in the last five years in both Ward 1 and 8. Currently, we're over 1,600 properties. Of those 1,600 properties, 200 are listed as being separate units, separate kitchen, secondary units. The majority of them have not done the Section 19 conversion as required under the current bylaw. So the, uh, the need for the, uh, the amending zoning bylaw would be that uh, we would be going to these properties telling them to come into conformity. Most of them cannot meet the minimum standard required under the square footage. And um, it would be us telling them to either come in, make the uh, variance now, or knowing that the zoning reform bylaw is coming into effect in the uh, future, uh, doing it now so that the people that have them now wouldn't have to do the minor variance. Okay, um, I'm having a, a, a real struggle, uh, Mr. Chair, because this is much broader on the licensing than I anticipated. Now we're not even going after the, ta uh, the targeted audience. We're, 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 we're taking a blank and, and, and impacting mom and dad, uh, uh, renting out a piece of their, uh, of their home and asking now them to come into licensing. That was never, never the intent of licensing. So help me understand how we got here. So just before that, it, it, how, it, this is not time sensitive and, and this is a member of the rental licensing subcommittee and it doesn't sound like there's been any uh, no. dialogue with the member of the rental licensing mm -hmm. subcommittee prior to this meeting. What prevents us potentially, I'm not gonna move it myself, I'm chairing right now, but from holding off and allowing not only uh, a dialogue offline with the good councillor who's a member of the rental housing subcommittee, possibly the councillor of Ward 1 as well, uh, but also it looks like the uh, Real Estate Association of Hamilton Burlington wouldn't mind uh, a conversation. So can we bring this up potentially if someone wishes to move it at the sure. next planning committee meeting? I'm just asking that as chair right now instead of a whole lot of procedural questions that are starting to gain momentum and we haven't even addressed whether or not we want a staff presentation. So Mr. Thorne. Uh, through the chair, yeah, certainly committee can, can okay. defer this to the next planning committee meeting and we can bring forward um, uh, this same report and committee can decide at that time if you want to refer this out for broader public consultation, um, which is again, just to stress that's all this report, report does is, yep. is authorize staff to go out and, and, and seek uh, feedback. Um, but certainly we can refer that to the next uh, planning committee. 
Um, it, 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 it does just push back a little bit when we be bringing forward the, the, the um, rental housing licensing report, um, but that is, uh, that is committee's discretion to do so if you wish. You still have the floor, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to delay anything, because I mean, we've been waiting long enough for it, but on the, on the second, I, this is getting just way con convoluted, now you're marrying two different issues. Uh, so I think to clean it up and make sure we do it right the first time, and maybe it's, it's perfectly okay, I want to make it clear this stuff, I may be completely wrong on what the, the, uh, the net impact, but right now, uh, being as close to this file and being involved for 15 years, starting with Brian McCaddy, to find myself in a situation where it appears that we want to use a pilot uh, to go much beyond what was ever comp uh, contemplated is concerning to me. So uh, I think it's best for us to clear that up, and I'm prepared to uh, uh, support a motion to, uh, um, to refer, or defer. Councillor Danko. Thank you. Uh, so this is a pilot for wards one and eight. Can I request that we at least go through the staff presentation and get clarification on what the roadmap is, how this fits in, because a lot of that is in the presentation, and then really understand what, what the recommendations, what we're being asked to do here today is receive this and then future reports coming back. So I would prefer to proceed with the meeting, go through the staff presentation, and then have that discussion on at the end. Uh, on the floor now, then, is that a motion? Because we would want to move to uh, uh, the to have the staff re a presentation. Okay, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favor on the staff on the staff presentation to this motion, Councillor Whitehead. So, Mr. Chair, if we want to be efficient, we can have the conversation now. But we're going to have the exact same conversation twice now, because we're going to need this additional clarification and information. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the other thing that should be incorporated in this is uh, 14, because at the time of the pilot program, 14 was not on the radar because it wasn't, uh, the bound, ward boundary decision wasn't rendered. And certainly a component uh, on Guard Street is certainly pretty significant student housing, uh, should be, should be uh, incorporated in the pilot program. That was the intent to capture the Mohawk precinct uh, area and beyond. So uh, that's another thing I'd like to be uh, put into this report. But, if you want to have the conversation, I mean, I just think it's a waste of time because the decision making is going to be really the next time when we have the full, fulsome on the conversation. So why would you have a conversation now if there's more to actually discuss before you rendered any uh, decisions? Uh, sure, yeah, it sounded like a question to the mover. Why would you have the uh, presentation now when we can have a more fulsome conversation two weeks from now is the question. Councillor Danko. Um, I, I think a lot of the answers are in the staff presentation and again what we're being asked to do today is to receive that this presentation we're not at being asked to actually move on anything we're being asked to receive this and then that will come back in a further a future report when we can delve into that further discussion so I, I think there's some convolution of what we're actually being asked to do today and uh, I don't want to risk delaying rental housing any further, and I think there is value in, in going through the staff presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess you still have the floor, Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I guess my challenge is that this report may not be necessitated in, in the form it is, so to actually take and receive this report where it may be improperly put before us based on a conversation that yet needs to take place is my concern. And when I read through this report, and I have, and I probably, I hate to argue this, more know, know a lot more about uh, the, the circumstances and the factual information around this whole conversation than probably anyone around this table. And now to say to the guy that's been involved with this as, as close as I have with some very good counselors and has some very legitimate concerns on how this report is in front of us is concerning to me. And I'm all, I'm all asking my colleagues to have some respect for all that time and work that's gone into it so we can get that clarity and again, have that fulsome of that conversation with something appropriately in front of us in two weeks. Councillor Wilson on the motion to... I support the motion for exactly the reasons which have been enunciated. Perhaps some of the clarity can come from the presentation. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of having the staff presentation. Uh, moved by Councillor Danko, seconded by Councillor Wilson. Yeah.
So it'll happen in a couple of weeks, it appears. And with that, uh, a motion to receive the written correspondence. Moved by Councillor Partridge, second by Councillor Whitehead. All in favour, that's carried. And then we will not move to approve the recommendations in the report. We'll look to do that in a couple of weeks. And staff, I'm assuming, yes, Madam Clerk. Sorry, I may have been out of the room, but was there a mover and seconder to defer the rest of this? Oh, thank you, Madam Clerk. That's moved by Councillor Whitehead and seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favour of uh, deferring into uh, uh, the next planning committee meeting. October 1st is our next meeting. Then we'll need an electronic vote for that. Okay, thank you. And the staff, this, uh, we, this is a familiar refrain from Rab. Someone's going to give them a call, right? They appear caught off guard once again. Yes, through the chair. So, so again, the, the point of this report was to seek uh, direction to go out and consult um, with groups like RAB, uh, but in, uh, we can do so in the next two weeks. And now, I don't want to argue with Councillor Clark either or uh, Councillor Pearson. They seem to have uh, definitive and good reason to uh, step out. But I wonder if also we may, uh, I mean, it was unclear at the start of the meeting and perhaps, and I don't read minds, but they were uh, exercising a, a better to be safe than sorry uh, uh, um, a model when they did just leave now, but perhaps they can participate in two weeks time if uh, we can bring some clarity offline as well on that, if they, if they choose. Um, next up, oh, do you want the chair back? Councillor Pearson, I think we're on to motions. I'd love for you to have the chair. Okay, and with that, you took my roadmap, sir? <laughs> mm -hmm, I see that here. Okay, so we're going to move on then to motions item 11. One, properties of potential cultural heritage interest in Waterdown. Councillor Partridge, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I, just if I may, through you, I have a question for Madam Clerk because the orange copy is not the revised copy that I have in front of me. No, you are correct. Uh, that's my oversight. But the pink, the pink sheet is the revised motion. Ah. Okay. So um, does everybody have the pink sheet then, which is the revised motion? You have it in front of you, and I'm just going to do the therefore be it resolved. Uh, therefore be it resolved that the following properties in uh, Waterdown be added to the city's municipal heritage register as non-designated properties after consultation with the Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee. And the addresses are listed there. Uh, 289 Dundas Street East, Waterdown, 341 Main Street North, Waterdown, 265 Mill Street South, Waterdown, 298 Dundas Street East, Waterdown, 49 Main Street North, Waterdown, 8 Margaret Street, Waterdown, 134 Main Street South, and 34 Dundas Street East, both in Waterdown. And B, Sorry, 340, thank you, Dundas Street East and Waterdown. And B, the council direct tourism and culture staff to include the above noted properties as part of the ongoing Waterdown Village Built Heritage Inventory work associated with the Waterdown Community Node Secondary Plan Study and bring forward potential heritage designations as part of the Built Heritage Inventory work. And if I may speak very briefly to it. Uh, this, we are now just um, uh, launching into the very beginning stages of a secondary plan for Waterdown. And in fact, I think the last secondary plan done was um, in the late 1990s. We then had the um, amalgamation and because of all the upheaval in Waterdown, there wasn't another secondary plan, a fulsome one done. And this is indeed for the core area. So three of the addresses that were on the original motion, notice of motion, have been removed because they are outside of the secondary plan boundary. And we wanted to tie them in. I want to thank the uh, Flamborough Archives, the Hamilton Heritage um, Committee 
for and, and heritage staff as well for working with me on this and for working with residents. I've had a chance to meet with some of the residents uh, locally over the last week. And, um, and I do apologize because there is certainly that letter from Hillary Piper and um, I hear the frustration. That is one of the addresses that has been removed, 29 Berry Hill, because it is indeed outside of the boundary. But in it, she notes that, you know, I certainly was not available and completely unavailable. But I just wanted to say that that was at the time when my father passed away. And uh, I certainly would have been available, but uh, for a couple of weeks, I was not. So I do uh, beg their indulgence for that. And uh, I hope I can uh, count on the support of my committee colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Councillor Clark. Thank you, and I think the council has done an awful lot of work on this motion, and I, I, I sincerely appreciate that. I just ha have a question in terms of the process. So they're being put on a non-designated properties uh, list, in essence, um, and they need to be assessed at some point individually. So that's a lot of properties there. Any idea on when all of them will be done, or what the process is going to be like on go-forward basis now? Through the chair to the councillor. In this case, it's a little bit different than normally adding it to the work plan. So normally we would add it to the register and then be added to the staff's work plan. Because there's already secondary plan work ongoing in this area, and a component of that is going to be heritage research, that has been lumped in with this. So these are a portion of all the properties sort of within that area. And it's actually, uh, in terms of process, in terms of ongoing understanding, it actually helps to streamline it mm -hmm. because all the research will be done at the same time. There'll be a larger cultural understanding. There's gonna be also open meetings as well, sort of associated with the secondary plan. And the reporting with that will come forward with the secondary plan. And I don't know the exact timelines of that, but I think it's sort of sometime um, maybe late, late 2020, but I would have to double check with my colleagues in the community planning. So to paraphrase, the heritage assessment on these properties will be happening as a whole, as a part of that secondary planning process, the report that feeds into the final decision. You are correct. Okay. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Parker, second that. And I very much appreciate that uh, question on process because it does provide some clarity to the process going forward with the secondary plan and exactly how these heritage properties figure into it. And you're quite correct, there, um, there are a number of them. I also want to point out, though, um, that there are a number of properties within the boundaries that are already designated that have been worked on by staff over the years. And also assure any residents who are watching uh, this particular meeting that we will, over the next um, several months, hold uh, at least three public meetings on the secondary plan and provide and, and be looking for lots of input. So this is the first time that my community in Waterdown and Flamborough have really had the opportunity to have a say in what that downtown core is going to look like and what exactly they want to see included uh, within that uh, secondary plan boundary. So I'm, I'm actually uh, quite grateful and quite excited that they will, as a community, um, be able to have a say. And this heritage uh, is, is just one component of that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So with that, we have the motion before us. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. And we're going to move now to notices of motion. I have uh, electric vehicle charging stations and new developments, 12 1. Councillor Danko, you have a notice of motion. And did you wish to move this up to Okay, thank you. Everyone has that before us. Thank you for that. Item 12 2 is Upper Mount Albion Road completion. Councillor Clark, you have a notice of motion. Did you wish to present or did you wish to move this up to a motion? There's a motion, so I need to waive the rules. Um, it's very time sensitive. So moved by myself on the waiver of the rules by and seconded by Councillor Farr. Thank you. Um, waiving of the rules, all in favor? That carries. Thank you, everyone. And on the motion now, Councillor? Well, uh, I'll read it and then I'll speak to it very briefly. Whereas the reconstruction of Upper Mount Albion Road has stopped due to a, I can't speak this morning, a dispute between the developer and the city. 
whereas the driveway entrances have not been restored to the original conditions and many have uneven grades to the roads, whereas the grades of the entrances to driveways needs to be changed to facilitate e easy egress with the road, and whereas resident properties adjacent to new sidewalks had not been restored to their original condition, therefore be it resolved that staff be directed to take whatever act corrective measures that are necessary to complete the reconstruction of Upper Mount Albion Road, to restore the driveways to their original conditions with retaining walls as required, to ensure reasonable grading between road and driveways for easy egress, to restore resident properties adjacent to the new sidewalks to original conditions, and to ensure that all road work on Upper Mount Albion is completed before number 1, 2019. That's moved by myself and seconded by uh, Councillor Farr. And to speak to it very quickly, so things were going along swimmingly on Upper Mount Albion. It's a, a, a road that was being uh, rebuilt. There were sewers and water mains, and, and uh, there was a lot of work under the ground because of uh, it's right beside the karst, so there was an awful lot of stone to, to be removed from it. We found ourselves earlier this year in a situation where the contractors, in essence, walked off the job because they were no longer being paid by the developer. Um, the developer was objecting to the additional costs that he had to incur, and we got, got into the dispute back and forth uh, with the developer. Um, the challenge that I'm now faced with and the residents are faced with is that they have some significant grades uh, uh, higher than the road that they have to drive their vehicles up and onto and they have not been completed. So it's gravel, um, there's no pavement there. Uh, right beside their properties there's no pavement. In some areas there, there should be retaining walls put in to, to hold back soil, that hasn't been done. And I'm really concerned that we're gonna be in a situation that when the snow flies there's gonna be challenges. And so I spoke with Mr. Sergi and, and I'm happy to have Mr. Sergi comment on it. Um, we really just need the city to do what they have to do to get this road uh, in the proper condition before the winter hits and then deal with the developer afterwards. So if we can just ask Mr. Sergi for some quick comments, I'd really appreciate that. Through the chair to the councillor, I had spoken with uh, Councillor Clark in regards to the timing and I think it's prudent that we take some additional action. Staff is still working with the, uh, both the contractor and the developer to resolve these issues. But notwithstanding that, we know we have to get uh, the works completed before the inclement weather. And that's really what's driving the issue at this point in time. Uh, there's no immediate safety issues, but we just want to make sure that we're in a good position before the uh, winter hits. And so I appreciate the uh, motion. So I'd encourage my colleagues to support it. Uh, and I, I concur with Mr. Sergi, there is no immediate safety issue. Uh, but once the snow flies and the ice starts, there are going to be some real challenges on those driveways and that road, and, and, and we just can't wait. We can't wait. We, we can't allow an impasse like this to impact the quality of life for those residents in that community. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So that's before us. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. So we're going to move on to general information, other business. Um, let me see now. Mr. Thorne, did you have some comments this morning? Oh, afternoon already. Tried. Yes, so, so through the chair, just, just one item, uh, and it's to seek committee's uh, concurrence with an early release of a report. We have coming on the October 1st agenda, uh, the staff report on the proposed changes to the provincial policy statement. Uh, that's the uh, provincial policy that kind of underlies uh, local land use planning uh, in the province. Uh, they are proposing a number of changes. We have prepared the staff report. It will be before you at the next planning committee, but it is um, a, a bit lengthy. Uh, and so as in the past, when we've had these major policy issues, um, we've released them early to the public. Um, so they have a bit of extra time to review it prior to the committee meeting. So with uh, committee's concurrence, we would we'd try to get that out this week, post it to the city's website. Um, so that public could have a bit of extra time to review it and then decide if they want to come forward and make delegation to committee. Okay. So moved by Councillor Clark, second by Councillor Wilson. Recorded vote then, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, everyone. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. And we, and we will send out a note to, uh, to committee once it is posted on the city's website so you can let any of your uh, residents know. Perfect. And I jumped the uh, roadmap. Sorry, Madam Chair. Madam Clerk, so now may I have a motion to approve changes to the outstanding business list? Madam Clerk, I don't see anything here, but Councillor Farr, go ahead. 
Just on general info, I just have a couple of things to staff. So uh, in all likelihood at council, Madam Chair, we're going to ratify unanimously the Municipal Heritage Report where today, um, uh, rightly, we've now designated uh, the old Ferguson pumping station on the south side of Ferguson. Uh, are, is anybody on staff? I had to step out of the room. I had a major IT issue. I've been uh, having trouble with that throughout uh, this morning, as a matter of fact. So the, to my understanding, there's absolutely no use for this uh, facility, city-owned facility at this point, because the new water pumping station has been built next door. So through you to staff, if that's correct, I'd like to know. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, that is my understanding in speaking with uh, public works staff that they do not need it as part of the sort of public works Hamilton water function, and they are now looking at alternative uses for that facility, but they don't need it from an infrastructure perspective at this point in time. Okay, uh, similar to, I'll just put you on notice, I'm not gonna move a notice at this time, um, 156, uh, 52 Charlton. We designated it, then sold it. May may go that route with the uh, Ferguson pumping station. As I recollect, in the Municipal Heritage Committee, you guys moved um, uh, a part uh, Part D, which uh, wanted us to um, inform or dialogue with Public Works anyway. Um, and so we'll let that play out, and I'll I'll, I'll be part of that discussion as well. So I, I I'll probably seek to sell it. Finally, real quick. Uh, I, I, I love working with the downtown BIA. We've had this impasse on this stretch of road between King and King William, uh, right house sidewalk, so the west side. Uh, the developer is going gangbusters as Leuna does. Um, they have, uh, from my understanding, uh, complied with the uh, temporary right lighting along the stretch, but the downtown BIA feels it's still too dark, and I, I, I can agree with them. Uh, and it can be uh, a little imposing, a little scary, depending on the time of night. So what can I do to get uh, some increased lighting without trying to uh, be overly onerous on what has already been, um, you know, uh, 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 auxiliary lighting to the satisfaction of the, the developer in this case? It, it really needs addressing. So through you to, to whomever on staff, I, I, need to, uh, I need some assistance there. And who would... Hey, if it's going to get done. So through the chair, we, we can follow up with the developer and see if they can uh, increase the amount of, of lighting. I'd, ha I'd have to review it against the construction management plan to see if they're already providing what they have committed to, which I believe okay. is the case, um, and whether or not they'd be willing to provide some additional lighting. Okay, I'll let you uh, and take if that's not the case, then. then we can look at what options the city can do. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So, Madam Clerk, I just want a question that says motion to move changes to the outstanding business list, but I don't have anything. Uh, they're in the um, changes package, page two. Thank you. Then if that's the case, hopefully everybody saw them and may have a motion to approve it. The changes move to Council Farr, second by Councillor Danko. All in favor? Oh, it's a recorded vote. Thank you. Just hang on, Councillor Danko. Yeah. I know. Just a second, Madam Clerk. You might want to hear that. Hey, Councillor Danko, you want to ask a question? Okay, just push your microphone. Oh, she's got to clear first, okay? Go ahead. All right. Sorry, Madam Chair, I just flipped it over and, and caught this now. Um, item 13.1A, the proposed due date for regulation of rental housing was September 17th, 2019. Proposed new due date, November 5th, 2019. Um, comment? Uh, so through through the chair, um, I'm 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 comfortable leaving it that way for now. We may want, depending on what happens in two weeks, we could certainly revisit. Um, but but for now, uh, that was the date we were shooting for. My understanding is that bylaw is pretty much ready to go, pending on what happens with this. So as long as that due date doesn't slide again, that's that's okay with me, and then that's what I'm hearing from. Uh, from General Manager Thorne, so thank you for that. Okay, so before us is moved and seconded on the outstanding business list. Madam Clerk, recorded vote again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. We dealt with Mr. Farr or Mr. Uh, Thorne. Okay, and then we're going to move on to item 14 is private and confidential. Item 14.1 is an appeal 
to the local planning appeal tribunal on the city of Hamilton's approval of official plan amendment OPA 102 and zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 18-114 for the lands located at 44 Houston Street South, 75 Jane Street South, and 9 Jackson Street East by Fengate Hamilton Lands GP Inc. and LPF Hamilton Lands LP. LS 19037, PED 19198, wards one and two. Councillor Farr to this. I'm prepared to happily move it. I hope everyone had a look at it. Um, and uh, I don't see a need to go into camera if I can get supported. That's seconded by Councillor Partridge. Okay, so it's moved and seconded that we waive not going in camera. Madam Clerk, I'll give you time to catch it. And then there'll be a recommendation <coughs> out of camera, correct? You know what, I'll, I'll, let's go in real quick. I, I just saw Councillor Clark, out of respect, I, it happens sometimes, he just got handed the, uh, um, he he's gonna love it anyway, he so. Got it this morning. But it, it, it should, we should get, uh, we should go into camera, so I'll drop that uh, proposals, my, if my seconder is okay with it. Okay. Thanks. So we're gonna move to go in camera, and the reason for going in camera, Madam Clerk, just a second, I gotta go back. Okay, may I please have a motion to move in closed session respecting item 14.1 pursuant to section 8.1 subsections E and F of the city's procedural bylaw 18-270 and section 2392 subsections E and F of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matters pertain to litigation or potential litigation including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the city and the receiving of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege including communications necessary for that purpose. I'm asking the public now and any staff who are not required to be here in the closed session meeting to please exit the chambers, take all of your personal belongings with you, thank you. And members of the public will be invited to return to hear any further deliberations upon committee re reconvening an open section, indicated by the removal of the frosting on the windows and the elimination of the white noise. The committee will in the event they are closed session for more than 30 minutes, wait up to five minutes, reconvening an open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media in time to return to the room. Thank you, everyone. And a reminder that counselors, your cell phones are to be placed on the ledge. Thank you. <laughs> 